Thank you for joining us for the Parenting at Mealtime and Playtime webinar. The Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics operates this program with the financial support of the Ohio Department of Health. The Parenting at Mealtime and Playtime program, also known as PMP, has continued to evolve over the past several years to offer the best resources to you and the families you serve. Today we are excited to share more information on programs in Ohio. The objective of this program is to demonstrate the importance of physical activity to families, to understand how to help families set screen time boundaries, to refer families to activity resources, and to develop an activity plan for families. Today you will hear from Dr. Robert Murray, a pediatrician from Columbus, Ohio, and past president to the Ohio chapter American Academy of Pediatrics, and Dr. Sarah Adams, a pediatrician from Hubson, Ohio, and PMP medical director. Dr. Murray will speak on the importance of play throughout the child's life. It will give examples of how children learn and what you can do to help with his process. Dr. Adams will give details on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected play. The speakers have no financial relationships to disclose and no off-label products will be discussed. The Parenting a Mealtime and Playtime program is here to assist you in your discussions with families. We aim to provide tools that will make your interactions more meaningful in the limited time that you have with them and contribute to positive, helpful behavior change. In order to access our resources, we recommend you visit our Ohio AAP website. This is the easiest way to access the PMP materials. This is available for all public health professionals at no cost and no login is required. When you visit the website www.ohioaap.org forward slash PMP resources and click the box that best suits your role. If you're a community health worker that works with a care coordination system, you will find our handouts within CCS as well. Our mobile app has our resources that may be helpful for you and your clients. This mobile app is free for download in the App Store or on Google Play. When researching for the app, search Parenting at Meal and Playtime rather than PMP to be sure to find the correct mobile app. 100 years ago, uh, at the beginning of the last century, people began to worry about what had happened to childhood. Um, we'd moved from being a farming community to much more of a manufacturing country, and the big cities were really full of little kids who, when they weren't in school, were either on the street or playing in the street or working, and many of them worked long, long hours during the day. People began to realize that... Um, childhood was being lost in the midst of all this and set about to reform uh, the laws around children and labor. And another group set out to explore ways of improving kids' uh, ability to play. One group led a drive to try and get playgrounds, park spaces, recreation areas established in cities across the country and was extremely successful, starting in Boston and New York and eventually getting these kinds of playgrounds all over the country. Um, and this gave children a safe place that was dedicated to play um, and was a, a real uh, change uh, within cities in the way that they looked and the way they felt. I included this quote from Joseph Lee um, because I, it makes me think about my own childhood, but he had this to say, play seen from the inside as the child sees it is the most serious thing in life. And that always makes me think back when I was a child at how really serious it was when we were all playing together and contributing to the game. So Lee recognized that this type of play where peer-to-peer -peer interactions took place was a large part of a child's early education, and it had a lot to do with their success in life. We're asking the question again at the beginning of this century, what's happening to childhood? Because although we have play spaces and many different environments that kids can experience and explore, the lure of screens has really pulled them away from those spaces um, into a much more um, sedentary, isolated type of on-screen play. And unfortunately, it's not just children. One of the real struggles we have as pediatricians is make sure, making sure that parents also uh, 
uh, put the screens aside long enough to pay close attention to their children. So we're trying to figure how do we re-engage children in the type of play we know that makes a big difference for their learning. The Academy of Pediatrics feels that play is a very serious business. Um, so we share that with the child's view that what they're doing when they play is really making their personality and sets about giving them a number of different skills which they'll use for the rest of their life. So let's think about the child and how they develop, and then let's look and see how play plays a role in that development. This is a striking piece of information. From birth, the brain will double in size by 12 months and triple in size by three years. That's an incredible rate of growth. The brain of a three-year-old is almost the same size as the brain of a grown adult in this little three-year-old body. The reason that it happens, you can see on the left side here, all that yellow in those panels are brain cells, neurons are called, and there's 85 billion of them in the brain at birth. But what we're missing at birth are all those connections between the neurons. And you can see that by a month and then nine months and then two years, it really comes to look like a, a forest with thick vines connecting all these uh, brain cells together. This happens in the child uh, in a remarkably fast period of time. And there are some key factors that make it work. There are three things that make all the difference for the child's early development. One of them is good nutrition. You can't build a brain if you don't have all the building blocks. And what nutrition really does is give the child all the things they need to build a brain and make it work uh, at its best. The second thing is taking that child and putting them into different experiences and explorations and environments that challenge them and make those connections between the brain cells thicker and thicker as they learn new skills. And then the third thing, and probably the most important thing, is that they have a nurturing adult to give them the emotional shelter that they need to go through uh, development both uh, socially and emotionally and intellectually. It doesn't have to be parents. It could be grandparents. It could be siblings. It could be a neighbor who has a really strong interest in the child. Any adult that provides the child with that kind of encouragement and emotional protection that they need can allow the child to develop uh, fully their skills, uh, social skills, and emotional skills. So these three things are really critical in early childhood. Good nutrition, lots of novel experiences, and a nurturing adult in their world. Let's look at how learning occurs from the beginning of life. If you look at a newborn baby, they, they have a very few tools at their disposal. They have a handful of reflexes. For example, if I put my finger in a baby's hand, they'll grasp it. If I brush their cheek, they'll turn their head and open their mouth uh, because that's the signal that a breast is near and they, they can eat. Um, so they have these handful of skills or reflexes, really, and out of those few reflexes, they'll build all their skills, uh, sensory skills and motor skills. When they come out um, of the birth canal, you think about the baby, suddenly it's cold and bright and loud and, uh, you know, they are experiencing gravity on their muscles for the first time. And this really right away from the first minutes begins to stimulate those connections between brain cells and they start to organize their world. So from this very immature state, they will build uh, all through childhood toward the skills that they'll use for the rest of their life. 
They do this with what's called sensory and motor exploration. They use all five of their senses, sight, smell, taste, touch. They use all the muscle movements, all their uh, uh, feelings of body position as they move and roll and crawl and walk. And gradually, from those early reflexes, they will add new and stronger skills uh, that allows them to better and better explore their world. We look at the child sitting on the floor, like this child with a Tupperware bowl full of beans, and we say that they're playing. But in reality, all these kids, whether they're eating or they're uh, on the floor or they have something in their hand, they're really uh, studying that and trying to understand how that fits into their world. So these experiences within different environments are the things that really stimulate brain cells to start their connections. Think about what it takes to walk for these young babies. First thing they have to do is be highly motivated because they're going to fall down many, many times. And they have to keep getting back up and trying again and again. Uh, they will test many different ways to hold their body and move in order to set up walking. You think they not only have to balance on their two feet, but they eventually have to shift their weight to one foot and move the other foot and then reestablish balance. And this takes thousands and thousands of trials on the part of the baby each trial letting them refine that skill just a little bit better and better until they can walk. And what's remarkable is that once a baby learns to walk around a year or a year and a half, they, they actually, it becomes an automatic behavior very quickly where they can suddenly get up and start walking. And then they work on climbing and running and doing many of the other things that we think of uh, in terms of early childhood. So the, the basic skills require a lot of sensory and motor practice in order to accomplish something as complex as walking. So if you look at how we learn to think, uh, you see that the first year is really heavily dedicated to sensory and motor exploration. As the child plays in their environment, they're actually learning. And out of that, they'll begin to develop language that describes what they're experiencing with their senses and their motor skills. And from language, they develop all higher thinking function, such as writing, reading, communication, social interactions with peers, and they become increasingly complex as they move through their uh, preschool years and into school age. If you think about a nine-month-old, this is truly a remarkable thing. If I take this young boy and I give him a yellow plastic ball and I say the word ball, the child will explore that ball. Of course, the first thing we all know as parents, the first thing they do is they touch it on their mouth because that's been their, their uh, main uh, portal to understanding what's around them. Everything goes to their mouth first. But then they'll begin to actually play with the ball. They get a feel for its shape. They roll it. They can bounce it. They can throw it. They understand what it's doing. Within just a few weeks, of understanding the word ball connected with that one yellow plastic ball, a parent can give them any other kind of ball and they'll use the word ball to describe it. So they're not using the word ball about that one yellow plastic ball. They now understand the abstract idea of what a ball does and how it acts and therefore everything gets put into that bucket as being a ball. That's a remarkable feat for a child who's only 12 months old. And you can see why as that brain doubles in size by 12 months and triples by 36 months, you can see all of the brain power being connected uh, by those neurons. How can you counsel your clients uh, and parents 
and grandparents and others to help babies during this time. The most important thing that adults can do with a baby is talk to them face to face, eye to eye. Talk, sing, touch, smile, but most importantly, respond when they give you a signal. If they turn their face to you, if they smile, if they make a sound, it's you, you want to engage and get a back and forth going. Even though the baby's not using words, they're very, very connected to adults from even the first days of life. Secondly, you want to give the the child many new things to play with and explore. And they don't have to be toys. Uh, Tupperware and uh, drumsticks and harmonicas and anything else that you've got in your environment is new to them, and they'll explore it. And then the third thing you want to encourage parents to do is point and name things. And when a child gets a new skill, they learn to grasp something and they learn to shake a rattle or something. Celebrate that skill because that has taken a number of experiments for them to get to that point, and you want to keep encouraging them to go further. So these are three things you could do to help young babies get a good grounding um, uh, by having parents and adults work with them. So childhood early in life moves into language, and, and that communication that at first is nonverbal, where you're cooing and you're singing and you're laughing with the baby, but there's no words going back and forth. By the end of the first year, they begin to start to make sounds and lay the groundwork for more complex communication. And that really builds the brain quite quickly. One of the things we've learned is that the brain doesn't grow all at the same time like a mushroom. It actually grows in different areas uh, at different speeds. And so all of us know that there's a period in the first year, at the end of the first year, where the baby is very happy and very interactive and they're just in love with their life. And then in their second year, they become much more um, independent and much more likely to uh, be emotional, to lose their temper, to be frustrated easily, to not be able to communicate as uh, sophisticated as they wish they could. And we call that the terrible twos. Parents are always uh, surprised and shocked at how emotional the child becomes. The reason that this happens is that the midbrain, our emotional center of the brain, grows very quickly at exactly this time between 12 months and 24 months. And the baby doesn't have a lot of breaks to slow that down and get better control. They just don't have the skills at that point to bring it under control. Interestingly enough, that same center of the brain, the emotional center, will grow very quickly again at the start of the teen years. So there's something in common between these kids in the second year of life and kids in their teen years in that they have to learn new skills to bring that emotionality under control. And the way they do that is with practicing front brain skills. And the front brain really uh, is, is dedicated to how to think. It's not so much information as it is process of thinking. And it takes us a lot of time and practice, just like it takes a lot of practice to learn to walk. This front brain set of skills takes a lot of time to develop, but it's extremely powerful. This is what will make a child um, much more under control emotionally and much more likely to be able to think about what is the consequence of what they do. What if? Is this a good idea? Should I do this? Uh, And that calculating and thinking and laying things out logically is all front brain, and it takes time for that to develop. So one of the things that's most important for helping a child develop those communication skills that allow them to take control of their emotions is this concept of serve and return, 
back and forth. Parents say something, the child says something, and the parents are connected and listening. If you see in these four pictures, all the parents are right there face to face with the child. And they're not only talking, but they're listening. And that's really the important piece of serve and return. It starts with talking and and interaction face to face, but it also involves almost everything that parents do with their kids as they get older. This back and forth and serve and return is just as valuable for teenagers as it is for two-year-olds. You can do serve and return with books, and so uh, the people who do research on reading, say the best way to read with a child is, first of all, pick a book that interests them, that's in their interest area. Uh, whether it's dinosaurs or, or princesses, you find something that uh, captures their attention. And then as you read the book with them, you point and you talk and you ask them questions so that you're getting them to think, use their memory and communicate about what they understand of the book or the story or the comic book. In this case, dad's reading the comics from the paper with the kids. Anything that engages the child like that in the reading is extremely valuable. And again, it's serve and return as the core. So play early in life teaches communication skills. Uh, It will be play between adults and the child, but later it will be play with other children. And all children around the world get into a phase where they do these songs and rhymes and chants like Eatsy Beatsy Spider and other things that involve hand games and uh, games together. All kids in every culture in the world do the same thing. It's part of their development. It helps them with memory uh, and anticipating uh, things that are coming and learning to be in control and um, uh, participate together as a group. So these are very early ways in which kids develop their communication skills. Probably the most important play in life is pretend play. It comes at a time when the child sees the world and then is ready to reinterpret that world in their own way. So they see us acting like adults and they mimic that in their own understanding. They'll do that alone sometimes. You see here with a girl with her doll. Um, Or they may do that with other peers and friends and then it becomes very powerful as the children together learn how to pretend as a team. Very um, strong stimulus for a child to learn social skills, communication skills, and um, keep themselves under tight control. Another type of play is rough and tumble play. And it's interesting that almost all animal species, certainly all mammals, like uh, humans and and, uh, monkeys and tigers, polar bears, they all display this rough and tumble wrestling kind of behavior when they're young. Uh, Often it's associated with fathers playing with their child, but it gives the child um, a sense of as they physically interact with others, what are the limits to that? Uh, What is play versus over aggression and rough and tumble play is really where they begin to sort out where those limits are. So it becomes a very important role, particularly for fathers to to do this kind of rough and tumble play to the degree that they can with uh, young kids. Um, And it really does give the child both a physical stimulation uh, to learn new motor skills, physical muscle skills, but also to understand the limits of using those skills. So once a child learns how to walk and uh, uh, climb and they have some basic Uh, fundamental muscle skills, they really need to practice a number of other things to lay the foundation for future 
eye-hand coordination and uh, athletic skills and participation in many, many other types of activities. And to do that, children need to practice a number of different things. One, they do this body in space where they learn, now that I know how to walk, I'm now going to run and hop, skip, slide. I can jump over things. uh, I can climb. Those are the body moving in space, and those are skills that kids practice and need to practice early in life, indoors and out of doors. The second thing is object control, where you're asking the child to play with something, either with their hands or with their larger muscles. So using a hockey stick or batting a ball, um, catching, rolling, stacking things, These are the types of things that allow them to do many, many other skills later in life. But they need to have their fundamental skills established and practiced. And many kids miss out on on exactly these types of skills early in life, and therefore it limits their ability to participate later in life. So how can you help your clients as parents help their children. Well, as we talked about, one of them is to do this serve and return. When you're talking, when you're reading, listen to them, laugh at what they do, um, and be amazed at, at some of the things they can do as they get older. Two, really encourage them to participate in play with other kids. Uh, You'll notice when they're young, they play alone at first, and then two kids will play next to each other, but they're still in their own little world. And then eventually, as they get a little older, around the age of two or more, they begin to play together uh, as peers. And this type of pretend play is very important. And then third, encourage different motor skills. Put them in different situations on playgrounds with uh, balls, with bats, sticks. Uh, Take them to the woods. Take them to farms. And let them do different motor skills as they uh, learn to navigate their environments. Uh, Those fundamental skills are the building blocks for all their skills later in life. So we can see we started out in that first period of life with sensory and motor reflexes that then are built into more and more sophisticated skills. They begin to add language and interaction and communication at the end of that first year. And from there, their higher thinking skills are built on top of those. So if you think of it, that early play where they're sitting on the rug uh, and they're looking at different things that is actually the platform for all later thinking, and it is their ability to do sensory and motor learning and then convert that into more and more sophisticated modes like language, communication, writing, reading, and so forth. So here's an interesting thing. We're talking about the front brain, and we want those front brain skills because that's what brings their emotions under control and gives them the skills they need to face many, many different challenges. Well, you can see here that although they begin in the first year, it really is in year three, four, five, six, that they explode in their front brain uh, skill development. And it will continue to be built and refined. Those processes of how we think will continue to be uh, refined all the way out to age 25 or so. Uh, So if a child goes through a difficult period, uh, they still have much more time to work on those skills later if they don't get exposure to them early. But by far, It's best if parents and adults work with a child early in life. The earlier, the better. So this is a fun fact that we've learned just in the last few decades, that uh, as we started to take pictures of the brain during uh, activities, we began to realize that with physical activities, when you put kids in situations where they're doing physical play, it really helps them 
get more blood sugar to the brain, uh, which allows the brain to be much more efficient, and it also helps them with memory. So one of the things that we've started to understand is that learning for a child is very much tied to periods where they have uh, physical activity and also periods when they have rest and they're not under stress and they're not forced to um, maintain concentration for long periods of time. So this is a very important piece of their day, this physical activity piece for making blood flow work well. School has many opportunities, and one of the things that pediatricians and educators in school are starting to share is the information that shows us that breaks in the day that allow for some kind of physical activity and stress relief are the best ways of encouraging learning. Um, so it's not a good thing to go from math to reading to science all the way through the day. What you want to do is do a burst of learning in a class and then take a break and another burst and take a break. Kids have always been given recess traditionally, but for a long time at the end of uh, the 1990s and starting into the 21st century, we're seeing recess start to disappear. But now the evidence is quite clear that recess and these breaks between classes uh, have a huge role to play in the child's ability to learn, learn new things and code them into their memory and be able to bring them back later. So recess matters and uh, the Academy of Pediatrics has really stressed this for uh, the last couple of decades to preserve recess. It's an important thing. There are two different kinds of play that can, can occur at recess. One of them is structured play, and that's usually um, adult-led or rule-based. So if you think about playing uh, Foursquare or you're playing uh, baseball, you have rules, and the child has to fit in with those rules and work with teammates and, and, uh, and the like. In free play, the child and their peers can kind of make up their own games and their own rules and their own rhymes and, and other things. And so these are two very different types of play, but both of them have great benefits. If you look here uh, at the skills that are being developed during play, during free play, children have to communicate back and forth. They have to be creative. They have to think uh, in, in ways that they can share with each other. They have to explore new things. But they really develop these social skills where they learn to compromise and they learn to share. Uh, and those are the kind of skills that they'll use for the rest of their life. The people we value the most as workers uh, in, in our adult work life are those who have good interpersonal skills, and it's on the playground that those are often practiced. Structured play is, is fascinating because it makes kids who may still be kind of hyper-emotional, it makes them establish self-control. So that's step one for building those front brain skills that we talked about, uh, those skills that help us with how to learn. Um, so self-control is very difficult for some kids, uh, as we all know. And these kind of structured games uh, make them use their self-control skills and work together with other kids. And those are very, very valuable for, uh, for children as well. So there's not a benefit of one over the other. It's important that kids expo get exposed to both free play and structured play throughout their life. Here's the problem. We talked about it a minute ago. The fewest minutes of recess occur in those schools that have the most need for recess. Uh, we have a tendency to take away recess for kids that have behavior problems, kids that have academic problems, uh, uh, kids that are not in safe environments and so they don't let them go outside. But these are the kids who need the most minutes of recess for stress management, for 
uh, enticing their memory so they can learn these new concepts and encode them in their memory permanently. Uh, so it's it's been a recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics that all adults and teachers give kids this recess as their own personal time. It should never be taken away. Every child needs recess during the school day. In the end, what we're trying to accomplish, uh, and as you work with your, your clients and you're in the home talking with people, we're trying to move the child to a point where they have very strong social and emotional skills. We want them to practice these um, so that they can manage themselves, that they think about their actions, that they make responsible decisions, they have good relationship skills with other people and other kids. To get there, parents need to play a role all the way through in giving children those experiences and really fostering those uh, experiences for children all the way from baby into adolescence and into young adulthood. It's an interesting fact, but the stronger the child's social and emotional skills when they enter school, the more likely they are to do well in school. It's a better predictor even than their IQ. So these are the kind of things that we really use every day uh, in school and at work. And it's more than just being a smart child. It's really being a highly skilled child that we're shooting for. So what can you encourage parents to do? I think the main thing is besides that nurturing, that serve and return back and forth, face-to-face, -face, constant talk and interaction with the child, the second task for adults is to find new environments for the children to explore and learn and interact and engage. Um, and we, here's a number of examples here. It may be sports, it may be the woods, it may be at the pool, uh, it could be in clubs after school, it may be music. There's a thousand ways that parents can entice kids away from screens and into a world of play. Um, so this is really the task as you counsel your families at home. This is really the, the second task besides serve and return communication. It's finding environments in which the child can learn to thrive. And remember too, play is good for all of us, adults and kids. When you and I get frazzled at work, we stand up, we go get a cup of coffee, we talk to our peers, we de-stress for a minute and then go back to work. And kids need us sometimes to help them do that um, because it isn't something that's built into their personality. So one of the things you want to do is keep them moving throughout the day when they're home or they're at school. Keep them moving into different places and environments for them to test their skills in different ways. Some of it's physical, some of it's mental, and some of it's emotional. All of it's beneficial. Thank you all for listening, and uh, we as pediatricians want to thank you particularly for the important work that you do as home visitors. It's a, a critical a counseling piece that really, really makes a difference for families and children. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray, for that presentation. I'm Dr. Sarah Adams, and we're going to talk about play and specifically how COVID-19 has impacted our play with children. The COVID pandemic has created an unprecedented obesogenic environment. It's like the perfect storm. There's confinement, social isolation, lack of fresh air and sunshine at times, school closures resulting in no recess, gym, nutrition support, and even mental health resources. We know that our youth sports and activities, including fitness centers, were closed for a while. And more importantly, there's been a loss of structure and routine. Kids are not sleeping on a regular schedule. There's economic loss and security, including food insecurities, an increase in fast food, processed food, which basically leads to lack of energy and is not nourishing our bodies like they should. 
screen time and the increase in social media consumption has really created a big part of this perfect storm. Increased stress and the mental effects of this pandemic has worsened and there's also been worsening health inequities. Now, being stuck in the winter months only compounds these issues and really creates lack of motivation and lack of the ability to move. Dr. Murray talked about the benefits of physical activity and play, but I'm going to take it a little bit further in regards to obesity and the rise in obesity that we've seen since the pandemic. We know that physical activity and play improves cardiovascular and cardiorespiratory fitness and builds strong bones and muscles and helps them develop those fine and large motor skills, helps weight control, it aids in sugar, blood sugar control, and reduces stress, anxiety, and depression. When we're more physically active and the kids get a chance to play, they sleep better. They're more balanced. They're more confident. They also become coordinated, flexible, and it improves their attention, concentration, process, speed, memory, cognition, and overall academic performance. And it also, in this time of the pandemic, it strengthens our immune system. We are constantly teaching our families what we can do to help them boost their immune system. And that's a big benefit of physical activity and play. We know, too, that it also reduces the risk of certain health conditions like obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, and even osteoporosis. When people think about physical activity, though, they think about, oh, my gosh, like when I talk to my families, I try to tell them, look, we're not just talking about going and running three miles or running a mile. There's different types of physical activity, and they're all beneficial. There's light. So this is things like just doing chores or walking or playing catch or most active video games, too. Even things like shooting hoops outside. Moderate is a little bit more difficult. When you get to that point, it's a little harder to talk. You start to get a little sweaty, maybe a little bit of change in your breathing. Vigorous activity is when you can't talk, you feel a little short of breath, your face gets red, you're sweating, and you can feel your heart beat fast. Muscle strengthening, which is a different type of physical activity, is pushing and pulling and lifting body weights, or any objects around the house. And bone strengthening is, those are your weight-bearing impacts, like jumping, tumbling, and running. Physical literacy is defined as the ability, confidence, and desire to be physically active for life. This ability includes competence in fundamental movement skills. These emerge starting from gross motor skills in infancy, like Dr. Murray said, and early childhood, and progress throughout their childhood and are honed in during the pre-adolescent and adolescent ages. Play-based fitness is entertaining active play that is strategically structured to include age-appropriate movements and activities that result in an optimal physical and mental health. And creates a lifelong love for being active. In other words, make it fun. And we want to connect physical activity to health and happiness. So what can be done? We need to remind our parents that it's important to establish dedicated time for activity and routines as early as infancy. At this time, it's so important to pay attention to those children that are most at risk for inactivity, racial minorities, adolescents, children and youth with special care needs, and children living in urban and rural areas that may not have access or even a safe access to places that they can be physically active, such as a playground. 
discuss the benefits of physical activity on not only their physical health, but their mental health, as well as their social growth and development, and link it to the benefits of whatever medical issues you are addressing, such as sleep, for example. Encourage parents to be an active role and get active with their kids. It's so important to empower parents to be good role models. And the child is more likely to be active when the parent puts down their screen and gets up and moves with their children. Frame this activity with an opportunity that it gives them time to bond with our children. There's so many things and our parents are so busy these days that this is a wonderful way to spend time together and not only help the child's physical and emotional state, but the parents. Encourage the parents to connect with this activity and have fun, like I said. If it's presented as a chore or an obligation, there's no doubt that the child will resist. Refer families to tools and resources to build this physical literacy, and I'm going to provide today some excellent resources and ideas for your parents. Encourage families to create their own family media use plan. This can be found at healthychildren.org slash media use plan. Basically what it is, is it's a script for parents to really understand how to use media, when, how much at different ages, and it gives them a nice routine that they can utilize very easily. Let's talk about getting active playing inside. I like to remind parents the four S's, stress, screens, sleep, structure, and schedules. Whether it's due to the pandemic or the weather outside, we need to learn some fun strategies to help parents and give them ideas of how to play with their children inside. It helps manage stress by empowering parents to use some PMP trackers that I'm going to present for screen time, sleep, and scheduling physical activity. We want them to be successful in playing inside and also make it easy and understandable for them. Here are some excellent resources that you can get from PMP either through the Ohio AAP website or parents can also access them from our PMP app. There's a wonderful activity sheet, screen time information, as well as information on sleep. They're fun, they're easy to use, and easy to read for your parents. Inside play. Here are some excellent resources that you can access online, and maybe you want to pick one or two that you can present to them, because it can be overwhelming, but they're all wonderful and give very easy to use fun ideas for parents to play inside. I've used some of them myself. And the list goes on. There's many and there's all kinds of fun activities with pictures and examples that parents can use very easily. There's also some apps, inside play apps such as Go Noodle Kids, Nike and Training Club, 7-Minute Workout for Kids, Swork It is really fun, NFL Play 60 I've been involved in myself, Healthy Hip Hop, and Kid Strong TV, but you have to have Apple TV if that's the case. And YouTube. Children love to watch YouTube videos, so why not take advantage of looking up some of these very common workouts that you can do with kids at home, including yoga, Kids Bop, Kids Strong, and Zumba for Kids is really fun. If the parent or caregiver has Facebook, there is a membership that they can belong to called Virtual Recess Club by Recess and Results. And this is really fun because it's actually somebody who either does recess activities and fun games either with her kids or other kids in the video. Inside play, I'm going to give you some 
fun ideas and activities and games that you can do and share with your families. Scavenger hunts, you could create your own scavenger hunt, or you can go to this uh, online referral to get some ideas. Obstacle courses, you can do this inside, climbing under, pushing, pulling, running from one place to another. You could also create your own circuit, and their heart.org has some really fun ideas for that too. Brain break and boredom buster cards. Beat the clock. This is a good one. Turn the clock on and turn chores into play. So basically what you do is you set a timer and you see how much time it takes them to complete a task. I'll be honest, I used to do this with my own son. Deck of cards workout. The way we did it with my nieces and nephews one day on a very rainy day is we took a deck of cards and each of us went around the room and we flipped the card over and let's say it was a four, for example. Then whoever it was, they would decide what activity we were going to do four times. So if I picked jumping jacks and I picked a four from the deck of cards, we would have to do four jumping jacks. So it gives them an opportunity to come up with some creative, fun, active ideas. And then by doing the deck of cards, it's mysterious in knowing what number of that activity you have to do. Milk jug bowling, you know, having milk jugs, throwing a ball, it's some, you know, or maybe they even have like a little bowling set at home. Animal Tabata. So there are free Tabata timers. And basically what Tabata is, is short bursts of activities with short rests. And so you could even set a timer and say for this amount of time, you're going to bear crawl or crab crawl or hop like a bunny and then you stop. Human Simon. That's really fun. You know that game, Simon, where it's the different colors? So you can set different colors around the room or pick a color in the room, and then you're going to say green, blue, and they run from the green to the blue, etc. Animal freeze tag is really fun. The way I did it with my nieces and nephews is when you ran around the room and you got tagged, you could pick whatever animal you wanted to be, and you froze in that position until everyone was caught. Tail tag is really fun. Basically, it's kind of like tag football, but you can take grocery bags and either do one tail or two, you know, like like flag football, but the one tail is fun. And this is a really great way to play tag when parents have or families have a limited space because it's easy to tag if there's not much space in the living room, but to actually grab the bag and pull it out, that's a whole different story. Healthy eating, truth or trash. So basically it's kind of like where you have them line up and then you say something is healthy, something is not healthy, and they run forward if it's true or they, they don't run if it's trash or if it's false. And then, of course, look around the room and find ways to use unique things around the house to make sounds, maybe even create a band and have fun. And you can even say, let's do it quietly, let's do it loud, let's do it up, let's do it down, side, you get the idea. Indoor snowstorm. Well, you need a lot of cotton balls to do this. And I think parents could be creative. Um, You could do little snowball fights, etc. Balloon volleyballs. So balloons can create all kinds of games, such as you could play volleyball, you could do it where balloons in flight is basically where you have to hit the balloon and not let it touch the ground. Balloon tennis, if they've got tennis rackets or, or racquetball rackets, they can play tennis indoors. There's so many ideas. Beanbag toss. Who doesn't love a dance party? Floor is lava. Have you ever played that as a kid where you have, you take out either cushions or pillows and you have to try to go from one to the other without actually touching the floor? Mall walking is 
you know, we all understand what that is. And you could also make board games active, meaning that when you hit a certain space or you roll the dice, then again, just like the card game, you have to do something active depending on what that, uh, what, however you set it. And then the 10 minute timer, set 10 minutes and be active for 10 minutes, no matter what it is that you decide to do. Some more options for inside play can include some of the indoor uh, rock climbing, park attra- indoor adventure park attractions, etc. that are now available now that things have opened up. So these are options as well. But let's not forget outdoor play. It's okay. Get your kids outside. Layer up and get some fresh air. They can make volcanoes, shovel snow, like have a relay, build snowman, or an outdoor scavenger hunt or obstacle course. I hope that we have provided some fun ideas to play inside so that we can manage stress, get better sleep, be more physically active, and set structures Don't be afraid to pick a few that you get really good at understanding so that when you're in your office or with a client, you can teach them quickly and efficiently. Thank you. A big thank you to you for your ongoing efforts to assist Ohio's families. We sincerely appreciate you spending your time with the Ohio AAP to learn more about these important topics impacting children's nutrition and play. You can access the Parenting at Mealtime and Playtime resources on our Ohio AAP website. Thank you to our presenters for all they do for the Parenting at Mealtime and Playtime program and for Ohio's children. If you have any questions for Ohio AAP, please don't hesitate to call us at 614-846-6258.